So I'd like to talk about the Sagnac interferometer with what we call attractor potential, which means that you keep the atoms confined as you move them. And the, the basis of this is this rather remarkable potential called a pinwheel optical lattice, as you, you can generate this from a pair of Laguerre Gauss modes, and it, and it looks like this ring. And if you zoom in, you see that there's this sinusoidal potential at the angular coordinate, where you can just put a single atom in just one of these sites, uh, and, and you can choose how many of these sites you want to have around the circle. But more importantly, by changing the phase between the gauss laguerre modes, you can rotate this potential any way you like. Okay, and then in addition to that, we can also make that spin dependent. Uh, so you can take your rubidium atom with two hyperfine states, uh, and then you'll have two traps. So one for each of the, of the spin states, for, for the hyperfine states, uh, and you can move these around independently. So basically, we're just going to look at one of the lattice sites now. Um, so it doesn't really look like it in the sketch, but radially, these atoms are really strongly confined. So the Hamiltonian is just a one-dimensional in the angular coordinate, uh, with this cosine potential here, and we'll, we'll counter rotate those uh, for the two different spins with this offset here, uh, and that, that is just based on the rotational speed that we can tune freely. And then on top of that, we have the, the background rotation omega, which is what we actually want to measure. So at the beginning, we'll just initialize the atom to the ground state uh, in, in one of the hyperfine states, uh, so just the ground state of this potential, and then we'll apply a pi over two pulse to put it into a superposition of the two spin states. So that's the superposition of the wave packets in this V plus and V minus potential. Uh, and now we're going to start counter rotating that by setting a function omega of t that accelerates and then decelerates these potentials. Uh, so let's look at the dynamics. Uh, so in the first stage between zero and t, we're going to accelerate smoothly from zero to let's say a value of omega zero of uh, 50 pi per second. Uh, and, and you can see that here rotating in the lab frame. Uh, and for the momentum, you can see it going from zero to 50 pi per second. And you can already tell that it's adiabatic because the momentum actually follows exactly the omega of g. Okay, and then once we're accelerated, we'll just keep rotating with the constant speed omega zero for some number of cycles. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we'll just, uh, we'll just do the acceleration backward to bring the potentials to rest again. And, and you can see that they're perfectly aligned at the end. Um, and again, this is happening adiabatically. So we have the wave packet always staying in the ground state. So if you look at the expectation values in the moving frame, uh, you can see, so that's the frame relative to the moving potential. Uh, uh, everything actually always perfectly stays at zero. Okay, so, so now we end up with these two wave packets on top of each other, and we'll just apply an inverse pi over two poles to recombine it between the two spin potentials. Um, okay, so how does the, the background rotation show up in this recombination? Well, basically, when you have a background rotation, you'll get a relative phase between these two pathways. And, and you can estimate that semi-classically as the synac phase, which depends on the interferometric area. Uh, so that's just the number of cycles here. And, the, and otherwise, it's just proportional to the background rotation. Okay. Uh, uh, and then if you have two wave packets with a relative uh, phase phi and recombine them with a pi over two poles, you get this for the population of the two potentials, which has the, the phase here. Um, and then it, it also has this overlap eta here, which is the overlap between the two wave packets. Okay, but, but if we're adiabatic, we know that these are going to be the ground state of the two potentials, so this is going to be one by definition. Uh, and, and then that simplifies this uh, to just a, a, a sine or a cosine. Uh, so then the, the population looks something like this and depends of the background rotation. And you can see that you get some kind of milli rad precision in this case. Or if you want higher precision, uh, then you just, you can do more cycles. Uh, so this is, is 10 cycles at a higher speed, uh, just to have the same total duration of the deformator and, and correspondingly, you get a better precision. Okay, so what if you want to do this non adiabatic So what we, what we want to do is we want to keep the acceleration time uh, as short as possible, because that gives us more time to actually accumulate a relative phase uh, but also because there's a risk of scattering while you're changing the speed. Um, so this is a map of the fidelity of reaching the ground state of the of the moving potential depending on the depth of the potential and also the time that you take to accelerate. And you can see that there's sort of a phase transition between adiabatic and non-adiabatic dynamics somewhere between a millisecond and, and 100 microsecond. Um, so let's look at what happens at this point for 150 microsecond and, and a pretty shallow uh, potential. Okay, so we're still going to 10 cycles. 
Uh, but if you zoom in on the first 150 microsecond now, you'll see that the wave packet almost doesn't move. Uh, and, and if you look at the moving frame, you'll see that it's actually moving in the opposite direction from the perspective of the potential. So it's basically being left behind as you move. Um, so that means that here, uh, now it's going to be displaced uh, relative to the moving potential. And then when you keep rotating and you give it a lot more time, uh, it's going to start oscillating inside that potential. Uh, and that oscillation actually happens to be exactly at the, 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 the frequency that you would have uh, for sort of a harmonic approximation of the trap. Uh, but remember, it's not actually harmonic. So we have a cosine potential, and also now it's pretty shallow. Uh, so you're actually not getting harmonic behavior, but you're getting this kind of breathing, breathing uh, motion where the amplitude of the oscillation gets smaller, but the width of the wave packet spreads out, and, and that's going to reverse sort of eventually over time. Uh, OK, and for the momentum, you basically get the same thing. Uh, so you're getting left behind by the moving potential. So the momentum doesn't go doesn't follow the omega of t, uh, and then, then you're displaced, and you get the same kind of oscillations. Um, and uh, most importantly, at the end, uh, you don't go back to zero, uh, which incidentally also is why this curve here isn't perfectly closed. OK, so how does that show up uh, with, the, with the background rotation? Uh, so again, this is the Sonnet curve for adiabatic dynamics. Uh, but now we're going to have this overlap eta here, which now is not going to be uh, 1, because these two wave packets here uh, don't line up, right? So you get a reduction of the signal. Um, so, OK, what to do now? Um, well, you can make this into an optimum control problem, uh, where you try to find some new field that gets us exactly to the ground state of the moving potential after the ramp up. And we do this with this new Julia package for quantum control. And if you're interested in this, I would, I would just point you uh, to my talk from the last March meeting. Uh, but fundamentally, you can do this by uh, just in a notebook environment um, where you specify the initial state, you specify the target state, you give it the Hamiltonian. And then the one thing you have to be careful about in this case is that we need to make sure about the boundary conditions, that we start from zero and we end up exactly at 50 pi per second at, at TR. Uh, and we do this with this uh, guided control here. Uh, so we take the original field and then we add this term where s of t is just some shape that's zero at the beginning at the end and sort of you know switches on and then and stays one sort of for the for most of the duration and delta omega is the actual control uh, and that we start at as zero and then we we optimize uh, we optimize uh, that as as a field um, uh, so you can run this optimization and you see that in a few seconds you get a solution uh, that looks like this uh, so the red is the original omega of t and the blue is the optimized one and you can see that what happens here is that you ramp up the speed uh, pretty quickly, relatively high, and then you actually go backwards again. You actually go backwards again uh, and, and flip the motion, and then you go to the final 50 pi per second at the end. So it's kind of like a throw and catch kind of solution. OK, so how do the dynamics talk for that? So on the left, you, ha you have the dynamics for the guess again for comparison. And with the optimized field now, we see that the interferometer closes perfectly. So that's a good start. And if you look at the first 150 microsecond, we now see that the wave packet actually moves quite a bit uh, compared to the gas. Uh, and, and if you look at the moving frame, uh, you, you really see what's going on. Uh, so the, the, the wave packet still lags behind the potential a little, uh, but then it actually catches up. So at, at the point here, the wave packet is exactly at rest relative to the moving potential. Uh, and the, the same for momentum. Uh, so you end up exactly at the, the speed of the moving potential, but you don't actually follow this, this pretty strong picking. So you get like a nice smooth curve. Um, and, and of course, at the end, uh, we just invert the optimized ramp up and we go back exactly to the ground state. And most importantly, during the loop time, we don't have any oscillations in the dynamics. OK, so this, is, this was the response for the non-optimized field. Uh, and now, because we have, we have a good fidelity in the optimization, uh, we get this overlap uh, of, of the wave function to be 1 exactly, and we go back to the full context. OK, so to conclude, uh, so I showed you the, the design of the structure atom interferometer uh, that uses a pinwheel optical lattice with freely tunable angular velocities. And you can make that spin dependent uh, for different hyperfine levels of a rubidium atom. Uh, and the, the big benefit that gives you is you have continuous confinement that really guarantees closure of the interferometer, assuming that you're adiabatic. And that also makes it highly scalable because now you can just do more or less as many passes as you'd like uh, to get to high precision. Uh, but if you're not adiabatic, then you start running into problems. And I showed you how to use optimal control to counteract that. Uh, so you can define a control problem. 
uh, of uh, non-adiabatic moving to the ground state of the moving lattice. And we're doing that optimization with, that, with this Julia package here. Uh, and, and as you just saw, you get this kind of throw and catch solution that really restores you the full context. Thank you.